Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this distinguished speaker series or seminar organized by the Hong Kong Academy of Finance. I am Arthur Yun, Deputy Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and Deputy Chairman of the Academy. I'm your moderator for today's session. So today's seminar will be run in a hybrid format. We have about 60 participants uh, attending in person, but we have a whooping 1,200 participants signing in online. And that actually is, um, is a demonstration of your sort of uh, attractiveness to our <laughs> audience, uh, Julia. Um, and the seminar today, uh, just to remind the audience, will be recorded uh, and uploaded to the Academy's uh, website and YouTube channel afterwards. Um, and in terms of logistics, we have reserved a bit of time towards the end of the session, about 20 minutes for question and answer. So please uh, start thinking about what questions you want to ask our guest today, uh, and I'll give you the chance uh, towards the end of the session. So ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished speaker today is Ms. Julia Leung. I believe Julia needs no introduction at all. I have actually known Julia for a number of years, um, since she's very young, of course. <laughs> um, and she has worked in a number of very interesting different roles. So she started off as a journalist, and then she joined the HKMA and became an executive director. And then she left the HKMA and became the Undersecretary of Financial Services uh, and the Treasury in the HASAR government. Afterwards, she has worked for a short period of time at OMFIF, so she can, um, can also be regarded as a think tanker. Um, and now she has become the SFC's um, chief executive. Um, so I actually calculated on average, uh, she spent about 10 years in each role. Uh, we'll come back to that point later because she has succeeded in all those roles. And that is very impressive. So let's give a big round of applause. Uh, I would like to introduce the um, audience. Uh, welcome, welcome Julia. And it is our, our great pleasure to have you attending this session in person today. Um, so let's start off the conversation. I've mentioned that Julia has uh, served in many different roles. Now, Julia, um, normally we regard that as career runways. You have actually embarked upon four different career runways. But whichever runways you embark upon, it has been very flat, very successful, very smooth, and you, the, the plane always take off. Um, I just wonder, can you give us a tip on how do you manage to do that? Because normally um, these job hoppers, if, or career hoppers if we refer to, are generally regarded as people who are not really showing any signs of success in life. But you are exact opposite of that. So there must be some secret recipe to your success. So can you share with us your experience? Yeah, thank, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me. And it's my great pleasure and honor to be meeting all of you in person and with another thousand signing online. Um, I would, um, uh, I, you mentioned that we've known each other for a number of years, and I think it's measured in decades. And, and since the time that we've known each other, we've always debated. So um, first thing is I do not agree with the proposition that having different um, runways is a sign of failure or ho job hopper. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I think it's a sign of um, having the courage to take a leap into the unknown, having the confidence to, to, um, to, to actually branch out beyond your comfort zone. Um, I, you mentioned that the runway has been flat and taking off. It's probably not as flat as you think, um, but, it, but um, in any case, um, I think I have um, four very fulfilling career. So um, I, that said, I do not think that if you do not change the job or do not change the runway, it, does, it doesn't mean say anything less from it. Um, it's just that even if you're doing this, uh, being loyal to the same company for uh, many years, um, if you do different things, if you are able to take on different challenges and actually challenge your different faculty, um, I think this is all just as um, just as good. Um, with the HKMA, I've actually spent 14 years, so I'm certainly not a job hopper. 
Um, I just have a very long, long career. Um, and and for, for that for 14 years, even though I'm holding the same title and the same position as ED uh, for eight years, you keep changing the different initiatives that I take, like uh, doing RMB business, doing QDII, doing all sorts of different things until I do not feel challenged at all. Um, so I moved to um, the, the other job. So uh, in, in terms of like um, the, the lessons you said, any tips about, um, I think I learned quite a lot. You said it seems to be very smooth and successful. Actually, I learned from mistakes a bit more um, because when you change your runway, you're bound to have challenges um, which you have not seen before. For example, just a month, a little over a month since I took up the undersecretary's job, it was September 15th. 208, collapse of Lehman. So I was, I was put in charge of negotiating with 15 banks, commercial banks, who have sold the um, 1.3 billion US dollar of Lehman mini bonds to 30,000 uh, retail investors. And you can imagine there was protests every weekend, there was grandstanding in the Let's Go and you were trying to come out with a creative solution of buying back, and it was very, very difficult. But we looked into um, the value of, of I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some of you here are what I call Lehman Brothers and Sisters, because we worked in different capacity, either from the bank or from the auditor or from, from the regulators. Um, we looked at it, we saw value in it, and we insisted with the, with the bank regulator as well as SFC's insistence of having compensation and settlement, we managed to have an outcome um, which, were, um, which, were, which were fair to the investors and relieve them from the long process of liquidation. So it was actually quite humbling experience having to face with all the difficulty, but at the end of it, it was actually quite satisfying. Um, but of course, there are um, another, um, you were saying that uh, what I've also learned is the convening, to use the convening power of a government or of an official sector in that sense. Uh, by, by what do I mean that sometimes when whether we are in negotiating for a buyout, for example, in the, in the, um, in the uh, mini bonds uh, buying out, when you have to deal with 15 commercial banks and their lawyers, it's really understandably, it's, it's really hurting cats. Or another occasion, you were um, trying to put together a Stock Connect, um, the initial prototype of Stock Connect when it was being conceived. And then you have to align all the interests of the regulators and the PBOC and the CSRCs. It was also difficult. And but then um, I think in all the, these cases, I've learned um, if you stick painstakingly putting together, trying to find a balance between their interests, uh, you will get things done. So um, I, I, I think if I had, you mentioned a successful career, if I had excelled, it's not me. It's the team that I've been working with. So the question becomes, what, when you, how, how do you make that work? Um, particularly when they are all very professional, very technical, and, um, and, and you are kind of relatively new. When I joined um, SFC, I had not had that um, licensed corporation uh, supervision experience. But I think um, the, the key is actually to approach any job, new job, with a lot of humility, with a lot of trust in them, and delegate, but at the same time, you're prepared to dig the trenches with them. So I've been very fortunate to work with exceptional people like yourself and um, the teams in the HKMA and SFC and the FSTB. Um, but I think there is one thing I do uh, bring to the table is the ability to actually integrate very diverse thinking and actually work out work that out in the decision-making process. So I think that's partly because I've been around in different runways and different jobs. Yeah, thank you very much, Julia, for sharing that with us. If 
Um, not sure whether you're aware, I, I've been working with you for a number of years and there's indeed one thing I learned from you, is so whatever bombs thrown your way, you always find a way of defusing it uh, with grace and elegance and the, the kind of ease that you deal with these kind of problematic situation was actually very eye-opening. Um, so I would urge all of you who know, have known um, Julia to sort of learn from her in that respect. So another uh, rather soft question. Um, Julia, you, you are the first female CEO of the SFC. Um, I'd like to see your experience of rising through the ranks um, as a female colleagues. Um, do you think that the career development scene in Hong Kong is offering fair chance to female colleagues or should we do better in terms of culture, uh, etc. cetera, in, in that respect? Um, when I was made an ED at the HKMA, I was the only one in, uh, I think at that time it was nine. And then when I, was, when I joined um, SFC in 2015, I was also the only one um, ED, uh, women ED among, among seven. Um, so um, I, um, and, and now I'm, I, I would say I'm very proud to be a first woman CEO of SFC leading an organization which is very, very uh, gender balanced. Um, it was, I was one only, but at that time, 2015, but now today, um, we have three. The, la the latest addition is our general counsel, Lisa Chen, who was um, last, last week she was appointed ED and making up a total of three out of six right now. So, and not only at that level, but also at the level of um, the senior directors, which is one rung below the ED level, it was 50-50, <laughs> right in the middle. And then for the director level, it was actually 60, 40 and 60 for women. So um, I think, think where the, um, the, the, the landscape has changed, it has improved. I, I still remember when I first joined the SFC, there's a closet and then there is this where you put your shoes. It was that, it's meant for men's shoes. <laughs> Even though I, I do not wear very high heels, but it's still. But now when we move to the new office, you have movable compartments where you can put whichever height of shoes. Um, I'm not talking about this at all. It's actually um, when you think that whether there is an, a, a culture which is conducive um, to, uh, to women uh, developing their career, particularly in financial sector, which is traditionally uh, dominated by men. Um, I, I would say if there's any advice that I can give is um, what I've observed, and I try not to stereotype because it happens with men and women as well. When you ask whether um, you are able, who, who would like to take up this task, a difficult task, or apply for a senior position, um, you will raise your hand, that, that's figurative um, speaking. And then what you find, very capable women, they, at most they would say, raise your hand, it's like this. But not this, <laughs> I can do it, or I can, um, I, I'm happy to take on this task. So what I'm saying is, um, you are better than what you think you are. Um, because women will think twice whether they are um, able to do it before they can, uh, they can volunteer for or, or take up this task. I actually made, not, not a mistake, but I actually did the same. When I was asked to take over intermediaries, which is a much larger uh, division than um, investment products, which were, was the division I first took over, I actually asked Ashley and Carlson, are you sure you want to give it to me? I've never done the job before. So, and I, and, and I said, well, are you sure you don't have a better person to do the job? So, so I, um, I think I can do it at the SFC because it has a culture of um, being able to recognize um, abilities and talent, but I probably will be dead in the private sector. Um, so on fostering environment, um, since I, I'm part of the leadership, um, there are things, there are obvious things you can do. It's like, for example, Lactation room. Um, we have lactation room on each floor. 
And I've been told, my, my male colleagues are very sensitive, don't ever touch that room. It's the most fully booked room. <laughs> Better than, more, more busy than the conference room. Um, and I also were advocates of um, one day work from home policy, which we implemented. Um, and, and I don't think it's, it's not just uh, having a lactation room or having work, um, uh, work from home policy. I think it, even for those women who is not planning to have babies or for men, men these, having these policies meant that you actually put people at the center of our, of our HR policy. And it means a lot because you are, um, you are actually having, um, you, you, this is a place where you can develop your career because the company is going to take care of you. So um, I, 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 I would think that women um, for, for, to, to progress, all they need is a, um, a, a, a merit-based culture. There's nothing more. But of course, in terms of diversity, and it's not just the diversity. Oh, by the way, I remember a debate that we had at least a decade ago, more than a decade ago, is that you were the one who's advocating diversity, uh, gender diversity, and it's that you like to have men and women in the same team. And I was like, mm, I, well, well, who, whichever, whichever is um, meritorious. So maybe you can talk about. Well, you were talking about me stereotyping different. <laughs> yeah, I, I still remember the conversation. Um, yes. But, but thank you very much for your sharing on that. Um, looking, I was actually, while you were talking about that, I was looking at the audience. Unfortunately, we don't really have a very balanced audience today. Um, so we might actually want to do better in terms of uh, these gender diversity when it comes to uh, the AOF functions. Um, uh, given in interest of time, let's move on to um, the more topical issues that we are dealing with uh, recently. So I, I think um, amongst the regulatory community or supervisory community, the most talked about topic in the recent weeks um, was the banking crisis, if I may call it a crisis in the US and then subsequently um, in Europe. Um, so what, what's your take on the recent incidents? Um, do you see any, what's in your view, the lessons that can be learned by market participants who are attending this session from the recent incidents? I don't know why this question should be posed to me, <laughs> but I will take it. Um, uh, and, but I would like to have your views on the uh, recent crisis. Now, I feel that the last three years, um, me being the regulator of the capital markets and you being with the banking sector, my feeling is um, it took all every ounce of my experience, um, my, the challenges that I had and, and the wisdom gathered from it in order to tackle the last three years. We've been together um, 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 riding through the Asian financial crisis. Yeah. And we were certainly uh, working very hard during the global financial crisis. Um, those are 10 years apart, like 1997, 98, and then 2008 and 2007. The last three years, four years, starting from 2019 or 2020 pandemic, is not, is not something which is um, as intense um, like a tsunami um, of the 2008, uh, but it's a series of mini crises. Um, starting with the um, uh, pandemic-induced market, uh, market volatility in 2020 March. The none, none of them are as systemic as the ones before. Um, and I'm sure you, you would give us a good reason for that. But, but it, was the uh, it was the dash for cash in March 2020. Um, and then there was the oil prices uh, going to negative, our futures um, going to negative, which we've never seen before um, in April, which, by the way, is, a, um, is you need to have very risk, good risk management to have the oil futures going from negative and then um, and, and the commodity prices zooming to very positive areas. Um, and then there was the Akego incident where a number of prime brokers, um, investment banks, lost a lot of money because of the concentration in, 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 in a family office 
uh, uh, very concentrated risk taken by a very leveraged um, family office um, uh, owner. And then it was last year. <laughs> last year was like, um, uh, you have the war going on and you have the commodity, um, you have the inflation and then you have interest rates going from zero to the, whatever current level. And, 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 and of course, all the time you have this backdrop of geopolitical tension. Um, and then the mini, uh, the, the, the mini banking crisis you referred to. So, the, the, of course, when interest rates are going at that rate, um, you bound to have fault lines in the balance sheets of banks, and you also have um, uh, you you will see those th those those fault lines cracking under the weight of leverage. So you have um, you have all sorts of mini problems coming out, whether it's the LDI funds or um, um, or, or or the um, um, the the LME problem, but. More specific to the banking crisis, um, the in the U.S., uh, I think it actually people tend to forget that after the pandemic, all the banking become digital, mm -hmm. and so uh, the SVB, um, as we know, uh, have 40 billion U.S. dollar withdrawn in one day. With the Credit Suisse, you have 100 billion um, uh, withdrawn in one quarter in uh, last year and then more 10 billion each day leading up to the um, to the fateful weekend and and no bank probably are prepared to have that kind of uh, withdrawal um, and for that fateful weekend I still remember um, we had a zoom meeting in uh, in March Correct. 19 yep. I think yes March 19 Sunday in the morning yeah. in noon um, on the on the Zoom, um, I can see Arthur with all your uh, colleagues were in one office, and then with the SFC, we are all in um, our own homes, and so you're saying that your office is your home, and I'm saying that my home, our home is our office. <laughs> so, um, so I I I I I I think as I said, but we within. Um, and then Cadiz actually worked through Saturday night and into the Sunday. But we have very efficiently and effectively worked out the playbook, what we need to do, figure out the exposures, and agreed on a press statement, which came out the first thing the following morning, which is aimed at calming the market. I think that kind of collaboration, teamwork, and we were nobody would think that it would go to that point um, prior to Saturday. So um, I think goes to show that you need to be very prepared uh, for contingency. You need to be very alert and to be able to 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 come out with. Um, you you mentioned that you're very calm. Whatever come your way, I think it's also true in both of our team. So that that was our um, our takeaway from that fateful weekend. But I would throw that question back to you, um, the lessons drawn from a banking crisis. Well, let me, let me say this. I think you raise a very important point um, <clears throat> in, in your response, um, that there is actually a macro environment leading up to what we have seen in March 2023. Um, the changes in, in the past few years uh, from a very easy monetary conditions to a much tighter monetary conditions. Um, and then all these um, uh, changes in market behaviors that happen because of technological changes, or the dynamics of deposit run um, changing because of technology. Uh, I think all those are very relevant points that uh, we should all bear in mind that the market is always a very dynamic place. And so as a regulatory agencies, we have to be acutely aware of the impact of those things on not the day-to-day -day supervision. If we think about the, um, um, the market conditions as a bell-shaped curve, then it's always the tail that we would be worried about. Um, and it's not really something in the middle part is, I think is not most difficult sort of equation to crack. It's really the tail end of of that bell-shaped curve that we both have been trying to, to tackle. Um, and I think if the audience haven't actually read the, um, the Federal Reserve report on 
um, SVB and the FDIC report on um, Signature Bank. Uh, I, I strongly encourage you to read that um, because um, they have been very frank in assessing what went wrong and what get unnoticed or unacted, not acted upon, even though they have noticed that there have been issues with those banks. Um, we ourselves are actually benchmarking our own supervisory parameters and practices with uh, what they have found in those two reports. Um, and I, I'm glad to say that we have actually found any glaring issues that we need to be worried about. Um, not to say that we don't actually learn from it. There are definitely issues like what you've mentioned. Technology has changed the landscape quite fundamentally uh, in terms of depositors' behaviour. Um, things like social media impact on sentiments and possibility of a completely unfounded rumour-driven run um, can actually happen in minutes. Uh, it's not like that we had days in, in, in the previous like, uh, decades to deal with these kind of circumstances. We don't have that luxury anymore. And so uh, I think you also made a point that we have to work very close together um, within a very short period of time. And I guess if you turn the clock back 10 years, we might actually have a week to work on that. But on that occasion, that fateful weekend that you, you refer to, we only had about um, several hours to really hash out some of the um, uh, things that we need to say on Monday when the market opens. So I, I think um, all in all, we're still trying to learn from what we have seen in, in March and, and April. Um, but indeed, um, I, I find that a, a very useful empirical test on our ability to work together and I'm glad to tell the audience that we work so closely together. Although we, we tend to think of um, um, sort of home office very differently, um, as Julia has mentioned, we tend to think of our offices as our home, but Julia thinks the, the home as the office. Um, so let, let me turn to another topical issues that uh, again is very, this one I'm, I'm sure you will agree that is very relevant for the SFC, virtual assets. Because you are going to introduce the new VATP regime in a few days' time, I think, right? Um, so let, let's landscape it out first. Uh, now, Hong Kong has always been criticized for being overly conservative when it comes to the virtual asset and crypto world. Um, but then things seem to have changed um, after the um, failure of a, a several high-profile schemes in middle of middle part of 2022. And people then realize that maybe there is a reason why you want to be conservative, uh, or Hong Kong wants to be conservative in the first place. But then uh, in November last year, the government came up with uh, a policy statement on crypto. And the SFC came up with this new regime for um, trading platform uh, that you will launch in a few days' time. Um, so let me start off with this question. Do you think that we have, by and large, got it right? In, in Hong Kong in terms of that balance between investor protection or customer protection versus market development. Um, wh what's your views on that? Um, um, the, way, the way you phrase the question as if we have um, changed is what has changed is the public opinion um, and also the other uh, jurisdictions. We've got it right all along from the start. And, and, and we got it right because we have, also, we have put the investor protection um, high on our agenda when we come out with a uh, policy that if you are going to get a license from the SFC, um, I'm going to, we're going to impose all the um, internal controls, investor protection measures in addition to AML um, to the applicant. And that drive away quite a lot of um, uh, of companies, and we are under very severe criticisms for driving away the fintech firms to Singapore and elsewhere. Um, but after the collapse of um, a series of these platforms, um, including FTX, um, they now they uh, it will they understand they now understand and accept that had there been internal controls, had there been um, all the investor protection measures then um, some of these um, harm to investors could have been avoided. And so even after the collapse, um, we are very confident that we'll just proceed uh, with our regime um, and launching the legislative amendments um, and, and also 
in a few days' time, uh, we will commence the licensing. So, if anything, um, we, we, we are tough and we are, um, we, because we see that these are the standards that should be imposed, but if anything, we are the most consistent and most predictable regulator in this space. So now I think um, our final guidelines have been released. It's very comprehensive. It has everything you expect, expected of a broker as well as an ATS um, operator. Uh, and now we are um, very glad that we become the um, leading example um, in how to regulate the platforms. Are you promoting that sort of balance in the international arena when you go to like IOSCO and, and other international forums? This is the same tune that we've been saying in all the IOSCO and FSB meetings. We've been saying that uh, same business, same risk, same rule. And that's been adopted by FSB, uh, as you know, um, last year. So I, I think it's not really us, but um, we, uh, we, IOSCO will be coming out with public consultation which on the platforms, which are pretty much the principles that we we have already embedded in our guidelines, which is avoidance of conflict of interest um, and a lot of the um, segregation of assets and safe custody of assets. Yeah, I think you're right that we have to be very specific and very clear about the principles that we are following when we launch these kind of investor protection scheme. What I personally have found in my line of work is that when you deal with the public, sometimes the public would want all the convenience in the world when things are going well. And then when things turn sour, then they come to you and knock on your door and, hey, how come you didn't sort of supervise them or regulated them um, more stringently in the first place? Uh, and that is the difficult part that I find in balancing market development and investor or customer protection. Um, I'm not sure whether you, at, at the SFC, how do you actually balance that? Because I, I always find it hard to, to strike that balance that, because you're talking about different time points that people think very differently, but you can't really just tell them that don't, don't cry when you get sort of um, cheated out of your pockets, you know, money cheated out of your pockets. Um, I, I think the basic principle is still investor protection. It's pr um, uh, I think that we have, um, f if this is the way that we regulate brokers who take money, um, uh, take deposits and and entrust the brokers with deposits. Uh, um, and then it, the, the, the kind of safe custody of assets is like crucial. Mm. Um, there are ways, there are things which we can balance development with, um, with, with uh, so some of these principles you can't change, it's unmovable. Like uh, customer deposits, assets needs to be segregated. Mm. Um, internal audits control, um, it has to be there. There are things in which you can adjust, like what we did with the insurance coverage of these crypto assets, um, which we reduce the insurance coverage um, to 50% from 100. Then it makes the um, less costly to operate. So these are these are things which we can give, um, but but not the basic principle. Um, I'm looking at the clock, uh, Julia, because in I think a few minutes time I have to open up the floor for questions. Um, but let me, there, there's a third topical issues that will always feature in um, sessions that I moderate. And I'm, I'm sorry to sort of push that onto you. Um, it's about green and sustainable finance. Uh, in the interest of time, let me ask you two questions. First, do you think that we have um, a proper ecosystem in Hong Kong to promote green finance? Uh, in particular, um, <clears throat> more recently, I think the market is talking about transition finance, the importance of um, having adequate transition finance, because not every project can be immediately green. So you need a pathway to green. And in between, you need transition finance to do that. Do you think that we have the proper ecosystem to promote that uh, to develop in Hong Kong? And that's the first question. Let me ask the second question as well. It's about carbon market. The exchange has launched the, um, the voluntary markets in Hong Kong. Um, but there are actually other types of mark, similar sort of arrangements elsewhere in the region. Um, do you think that Hong Kong would ultimately offer um, a, a good sort of um, service and, and platform for people who need to trade in these kind of carbon credits to use our platform? What's our 
what do you think would be our strength um, or a comparative advantage when compared with similar platforms in the region? Let me take the first question first. Whether we have the ecosystem to promote or develop um, the uh, ESG, in particular transition finance. Um, first of all, I think the ecology is just like the VA um, ecology. You need to start somewhere. Um, so the ecology for promoting or developing ESG, um, first of all, I think as regulator, as part of um, the bigger government, we should stay in the forefront of, um, of sustainable finance uh, because, first of all, it is our civic duty to do so um, and to mobilize, um, mobilize um, finance into uh, mo um, resources into financing the transition to a, uh, a low-carbon econ economy. And it's, it's both not only bank borrowing, done through bank borrowing, but also investment funds and um, other means of like bond issuance. It's just as important. Um, funds is important because they are the buy side. If the buy side uh, decide that um, this is my appetite, I want to invest in um, different, different shades of green, I, I don't want brown, then they will drive changes that way. So, um, but Unfortunately, uh, we still live a, in a world in which there's more brown than green. Mm. And you cannot just by exclusion says, oh, I can, I, I only would invest in, I mean, you can, if this is your appetite, only in, gray, in dark green. Um, I think we should, I mean, in terms of my own um, approach towards it, I think transition finance makes sense. Mm. If if you can mobilize resources and your resources, whether it's bank borrowing or funds, invest in projects that will reduce um, carbon emissions, a very clear objective that is already um, um, already making one more steps because you can't really um, achieve green in one step. And so it's, a, it's important. So what is the role of regulator in all this? Um, on my side, um, I think setting the regulations and the standards uh, for reporting is an important part of it. Um, now, currently, the exchange uh, has a public consultation on um, sustainable finance reporting by a listed com com uh, corporation. And it's going to benchmark the, the standards um, to be finalized by ISSB by the end of June. Um, so, um, I think this is the most important part because without the data, without um, you can't really provide quantifiable or measurable and comparable investments by whether it's, whether it's the funds or by the bank in borrowing. So um, providing some sort of um, consistency and, um, and comparability in the information being available in the public would be important. But at the same time, um, because the ISSB standards and the European standards have very high standards in terms of scope three emissions, which is something which is lacking in terms of um, the data in this part of the world. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. And so my other capacity in the IOSCO and in the sustainable task force under IOSCO is to achieve a ISSB is to discuss with ISSB and provide feedback um, on how to set the standards so that so the standards could have high standards, but you provide some um, implementation guidance, a pathway to achieve those standards. By that, I meant uh, we meant the standards could still be high. Scope three emissions needs to be reported but provide a relief um, in terms of time-based relief, like you can do it um, in a number of years, a transition period of three, three years. Um, you, have, you give jurisdiction some flexibility in order to, uh, to calibrate the standards so that you can get there. Um, for, for Hong Kong, we are um, very keen to be able to have a reporting standards which make strong reference um, and align with ISSB, which is the TCFD standards also, in order to have a start. Because it's important for us, 
because we are an international financial center and we intermediate capital. And we need, um, and we have a bigger financial footprint than the physical carbon emissions footprint because of the listed companies of that 80% um, of our, of our um, market cap are from mainland. And when we um, require that kind of standards, reporting standards, that means that um, the listed companies in Hong Kong will have to comply. And it's again a chicken and egg. If we have a running start with these standards, then the data and the other things will, will, fall, will, will gradually come in. And of course, we cannot just set the standards. We, that's why we have a group which we um, co-chair with the HKMA to build the capacity building, the data standards, and um, provision of data. Mm. You, that's how we can build that ecology. Yeah, indeed, data is a, is a tough issue because banks are also complaining to us that if we require them to calculate the financed emission sort of um, um, numbers, then at least they need the, the numbers from the corporates uh, in terms of the emission sort of situation. Um, and that is a very difficult thing uh, for now. So we, we actually are, are trying to um, compile um, some estimator engines for the industry to use um, so that they can actually, by inputting some basic parameters, they can actually calculate or estimate um, the emission levels of their customers. Um, and we, we are working on, on that one, and hopefully that would help bridge one of the data gaps. I did not answer your question, yeah. so core climate. Um, it's difficult. Mm. Um, quite a lot of jurisdictions have set up um, similar carbon, voluntary carbon credits trading platform. Um, there is a need to have very robust standards um, of trading and, 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 and verification. <coughs> And, um, uh, and it's still being in the emerging area. But you ask what is our comparative advantage is again um, our link, um, our financial links with the mainland. Mm -hmm. So I understand and I've also been to Beijing, um, there, the mainland's voluntary carbon credits standards are very different from the rest of the world, the fairer standards. Um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to, um, to connect. Um, so I think that we, but um, at least we made, uh, the exchange made a start um, by having this traded, a trading platform up and running and making a meaningful start in mm. that area. But a lot of work needs to be done. Yeah, thank, thanks, Julia. Um, I think it's time for Q&A. Um, we have about 17 minutes left in this session for question and answer. Um, those who, um, who are attending this event here can just raise your hands and, and ask the questions. But before you ask, um, please also um, indicate your name and your affiliation so that the audience who have dialed in uh, would know who is asking the question. Um, for those who are dialing in, you can also type your questions in the um, question box and I will see it. Uh, on an iPad uh, right next to me. Um, so who would want the floor? Um, yeah, Tony. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you. Uh, you can use the microphone. Very useful and enlightening talk. I just want to pick up the, the one of the, the last topic in terms of uh, sustainable um, uh, uh, ESG, in short. Uh, as, a, as a corporate independent director, um, the issues that we have at the moment for very large SOEs in China, example, is that it percolates from the international standards, uh, uh, which comes from the, uh, the Paris Convention and so on, into uh, country regulatory standards, and then uh, into corporate governance standards. Uh, the, the issue for us, of course, is, is actually preparing within the organization uh, the metrics which enable us to actually to do reporting. Otherwise, we won't be able to do so. So, so I think uh, 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 the regulatory agencies around the world, and no doubt the SFC and the stock exchange doing the same, is to work with uh, corporates to ensure that they, they do come up, with, in fact, with ideas. And uh, I would encourage that. That's, uh, the second thing is, is this, is that once the standards are established, the, the next question is assurance. 
how do you ensure that those standards are complied with? Then you, you would then uh, uh, and go into the area of uh, the, the, the assurance practitioners, uh, how they're going to actually do the work because, uh, and how their work is being policed by the regulators, which would be the next question. And I, I'd be very interested in, in your views on that because that is something which is worrying uh, to, to corporations because they are trying the very best uh, to come up with standards and trying the very best to comply with the ISSB standards, which are not yet standards, but they are at the moment uh, exposure drafts, which uh, we study very carefully. Uh, but then uh, the next step is once uh, those standards are promulgated, uh, how would assurance, in fact, uh, be, uh, uh, be implemented and how would uh, the assurance themselves be policed? I'd, I'd be very interested in your views. Um, that's a very, very good question. Um, assurance is very important. Um, I think early on um, when we were looking into the standard setting, um, we, IFRS is um, be in the best position to have a um, ISSB set up and do the standards and then we also at the same time we're very keen that there should be assurance on those standards. Um, so uh, IOSCO actually has a work stream on insur assurance and it's put out a recommendation report which, did, um, which actually did not, um, which actually said, um, it, it did not specify whether it's the auditors and but basically if you are um, a consultant um, then um, this is also open to the jurisdiction to decide. So um, I, uh, the exchange um, will come out with, um, with guidance. They, 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 they will come up with guidance of how to, when they finalize the standards, but also on the guidance on assurance. And um, there's been discussions with the um, ICPA and other, other um, consultants um, in that regard. Um, so I think there's this, and uh, uh, this is still work in progress in that sense. But I do understand the anxiety and 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 the companies that are doing it, uh, doing a serious job in terms of meeting with the standards which are still being formulated, um, the exposure drafts as you mentioned, and particularly on the matrix part, I would mention that um, this is something that we very focus because originally in the exposure draft the SASB standards and the matrix that it used for the sectorial, for the sectors were being, um, um, were being referenced that we shall consider, um, shall consider um, the exposure drafts, actually the wording is, um, shall, shall consider the SASB standards, um, which um, I think in the implementation guidance, um, there will be a lot more flexibility in how to refer so basically, the matrix, um, um, they were given a lot more time um, uh, before the adoption of the very, very complicated matrix um, in the SASB standards. Thank you. Yeah, it's also important to recognize Tony's comments that he strongly encourages the regulators to set standards on disclosure. Okay. Hi, Please. I'm Kashi Lau. And, uh, and from BCT Group and the Trustees Association. First of all, congratulations, Julia. As women, we, you make us very proud. And let's just, let me ask a question with a softer touch. Um, now, with the world facing so many challenges for varied type of development and unexpected uh, challenges. Now, as a, as a new leader of the SFC, um, now, what would you do differently? There's no judgment call to it. I didn't say better, but how would you do differently as, as a leader for the, for the head of a regulatory body, as well as a leader for an association where you are, as a woman, how would you have done, what would you do differently? Um, the question is, um, is a woman leader doing things differently from Amen. As well as, as, just as a being a head of a regulatory body, being a new leader, not ah. just woman. <laughs> ah. um, so meaning you can blame whatever problems on Ashley. <laughs> <actually. laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, I uh, wouldn't do that. Um, I think every leadership has its own style and um, the way that we lead. I think I mentioned some of it, um, like putting people first. Um, and I think when we had this discussion of um, diversity, gender diversity in the team, um, I, I do observe that um, as, um, as uh, we, we, we have different management styles, mm. and I'm not stereotyping women, but women tend to pay a lot more attention to details and the way how the management of the team. So, um, and, and uh, as a leader of the, um, of a organization, uh, particularly of our regulator, um, I do think that it's important that you move, um, you move, I mean, a, a lot of the principles, a lot of um, upholding fairness, orderliness of market, it will be the same. And it's very important to maintain that because this is in our mandate, in our DNA, uh, in, within the SFO. So it will not be any different for, um, between me and, and any of the predece predecessors. Um, but how to reach consensus on some development topics or how to deal with an issue, um, it will be very different. Um, and or, or, or the, the management of it will be, or management of the team will be a bit of different. So I, um, I mentioned that um, I, um, as uh, you have to delegate because it's too many, um, too many work going on, but at the same time, very prepared to dig the trenches um, with the team. So um, I um, and 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 I think that's 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 one thing, which is um, uh, I I think it's important that you you. Um, I, I actually quite quite miss digging the trenches um, when you are heading a uh, and a, a division um, as large as the one that I used to. Um, a lot of day-to-day -day work, um, and which needs your attention. But I think as the leader of this group, I think it's it, you have my sight on the important uh, um, risk issues and development issues, um, and. And of course, um, that's uh, uh, that's 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 probably more um, making sure that the back office also functions um, functions well. I think that's that's probably one of the thing that I, I, I need to work harder on. Thank you, um, Julia. We oh, okay, um, please. And then we have one question. I think we can take one more questions from the floor, and then I will have one quick questions from the Dalian audience. Uh, Jeremy Lamb from Deacons. Uh, Julia, I hope you don't mind, but can I ask you a slightly harder question than Kashi? Um, a, a number of commentators uh, continue to sort of uh, give some fairly negative press about Hong Kong. They, they question whether we can remain as an international financial center and indeed capable of attracting and retaining international talent in our financial services. What would you say to them? Um, well, actually, the questions that came in through the um, um, uh, uh, the Dalian audience uh, is kind of related to this. Uh, it asks about what actions we need to take to um, continue to develop, uh, or the, the word that the question used was reinvigorate our role as Asia's premier financial center facing I, all the challenges. I think all these uh, first international publicity actually could be a good thing because they made us uh, think harder our shortfalls, what we, I mean, in the past when, when, when everything is going for you, you probably uh, tend to be very complacent. But now that um, last year when we came out of the COVID, slower than other jurisdictions, um, you see talents flowing, um, and then also some of the fund, may, may, maybe some of the fund flows. And then you really have to think hard. Um, so uh, your question is what do I have to say to them? I think it's important that we, um, first thing, come to Hong Kong and see for yourself whether it's as bad as it's, it is, um, you say, you think it is. And we have a lot of visitors coming in through in the first quarter and even now, which um, they feel the dynamism of this place. Um, I think uh, the HKMA did a great uh, job in um, launching the financial summit in November of last year. 
to show to the world and invite people coming. And also, um, I um, and a lot a lot of trips. I think Arthur, you made a lot of trips to Europe and to yeah. other parts of the world, um, trying to reach the audience and let them know that things have been um, what it is. So I think um, we all knew even back then that we are not great in um, blowing our own trumpets and marketing and. Um, but I, I I think the reality is um, that we should. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, um, actually been reaching out to, um, to those um, who have misconceptions about Hong Kong, but at the same time doing the real work as well. Um, um, and, and, and giving some thoughts about uh, just what Arthur was asking me. Um, of what is their comparative advantage? How do you do better? Um, so I spent quite a lot of time on the, um, on the Connect schemes and all sorts of Connect schemes, taking the opportunity um, and made three trips to China in two months. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um, I do have another question uh, coming in um, from the Dalian audience. Uh, what do you think are the toughest challenges that the financial industry in Hong Kong will face in the next few years? And what would be the advi your advice to them? Uh, related to that, um, there's also questions about mainland related initiatives. What, what's the top priority, top one or two priorities uh, of the SFC when it comes to mainland related initiatives? As we said uh, when we were um, discussing the um, crisis um, issue, I, um, I, I do think that this is a time, um, in the last three years I've been preaching resilience. I will continue to do so to be very resilient, to adopt a strategy which is, um, which makes sure that you are resilient against the market turmoil and the very, be, be on top on your risk management game. Um, and that's, to many, it's like just plain defense. Um, for last year it worked because if you are protecting your downside, you're probably um, doing fine, okay. But this year, you also have opportunities. And so you also have to play attack as well, mm. the offense. Um, so I, I, it, it's, it's really um, while you are um, looking into that opportunities, you don't forget that you still have a landscape which is investing landscape which is very tough, um, which as we just discussed, the macro factors and the um, and the technology uh, could change it overnight. And so I continue to give that advice of being stay vigilant and be mm. resilient. Mm. Um, as to the um, mainland initiatives, um, I think this is our, continue to be our uh, comparative advantage to be the gateway between uh, mainland uh, capital markets and the rest of the world. Having been to um, Beijing twice, then uh, you see that they are very keen to open up um, and will use that opportunity to um, actually have a wholesale um, in improvement in the many con um, connect schemes that we have with them, um, which includes the stock connect um, in terms of the efficiency and eff efficacy of that market, and also in terms of the different products, and of course the renminbi uh, internationalization um, an improvement in the Wealth Connect um, and all this that we are working on. So thank you very much, Julia. Um, I'm afraid we're coming to the end of the session because my clock is ticking down now. Um, uh, so let me just say this, on behalf of all the AOF members uh, who attended this session, and we not only have um, uh, AOF members, but we also have friends of AOF at attending the sessions. Um, let me uh, say th a big thank you to you on, on their behalf uh, for your very candid sharing. I'm sure they have benefited a lot from your very inspiring uh, viewpoints uh, on a number of uh, um, topical issues in particular. Uh, but before we close, I would like to take the opportunity to thank two AOF members in particular. Uh, they are one of your colleagues, Roger, mm -hmm. Roger Chang of the SFC and Michael Footman from PricewaterhouseCoopers. They have actually helped us in preparing for this session. 
um, and coming up with all the I ideas of questions that can be thrown at you. Um, so blame them, not me. Yeah, those, no wonder uh, it's so uh, tough. It's from my from inside. <laughs> yeah, but but thank you. That's that's why we want to get somebody from the inside. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Roger and, and Michael, for your contributions to this uh, event. Um, so I would like to thank also the uh, members and the friends of AOF for joining this uh, session today. Um, if you'd like to know more about our, our upcoming activities, we do have a lot of upcoming activities lined up. Uh, please follow AOF on LinkedIn um, by scanning the QR code that I think we'll be putting on the screen uh, very soon. Um, so once again, thank you very much, Julia, uh, and thank you and goodbye. As I look forward to seeing you soon uh, in the next event. Thank you very much. Thank you.